Welcome everyone, my name's Sylph, and this is my attempt to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon White with only Bug-type Pokemon. The full rule set for this run is listed down below, but put simply, only the first Bug-type encounter in each route or area can be caught, if a Pokemon faints it must be permanently boxed, no items except held items in battle, party Pokemon levels are limited to the next gym leader or the final league member's ace, and finally the battle mode must be put on set at all times. The Bug-type Known historically to be quite a weak one all things considered, I do feel as though it's gotten a bit better as time's gone on. Part of this is definitely the plethora of new bug types that have been revealed, but they do keep Psychic, Grass, and Dark types in check too. What I've always found interesting is the concept of Gen 5 only allowing you to work with the new Gen 5 Pokemon in the main story. And since we're all familiar with the standard OG bug types, I think this kind of run will be fascinating. As for our encounters, well, there's actually a surprising number of them, all really cool Pokemon. Pokemon in my opinion, and many of which we haven't gotten the chance to use before. But I will say, there's a reason this run hasn't been done on YouTube before. This is gonna be tough, but without any further ado, let's give it a try. Alright, you know what, I'm just gonna come out and say it, no Pokemon story has ever matched that of black and white. Man oh man, what a set of games this is. Masterpieces. Alright, you know how at the beginning of the games the professor shows you a Pokemon? You'd assume Game Freak wants that Pokemon to be a sort of mascot for the generation, but pfft, no one gives a f about this thing. Even Patrat became more popular, and I mean, look at that thing. Now we have a bit of a problem. There are technically no bug type encounters until after the first gym, so I've used the Pokemon Universal Randomizer to adjust our starter to what would have been our first encounter anyway, a Venipede. Now the only same type attack bonus or stab move we begin with is Poison Sting, so uh, we're gonna have to rely on Rollout for our rivals. Problem is, it takes a while to build up power, and if we miss even once, we're screwed. Didn't think the early game would be this intense, but we survived the first battle on literally 1 HP, and then Charon's battle wasn't much better as we had 4 HP before leveling up. Goodness gracious. Okay, there's a bedroom joke in here somewhere, I, I just know it. Huh. Not gonna lie, that's pretty good advertising, Nintendo. You can have a massive destructive or in your bedroom and your Wii won't even have a scratch. Ah, uh, I can't remember the last time I played these games in the springtime. This season looks beautiful in game. Speaking of beautiful, it's time for a battle of this generation's mascots, apparently. For enduring that spectacle, Professor Juniper awards us with some Pokeballs, meaning our run has officially begun. We quickly arrive in Accumula Town, where this is happening, quite the formation, and afterward, N challenges us to battle. This time around, Rollout performs much better, even through a growl at the start. Likely because Venipede hates cats. I, I don't know why, you'd have to ask her, man. Oh, I almost forgot. Let me introduce you to Ashley. Ashley has a lonely nature, which gives plus attack and minus defense. Not bad, and also has the swarm ability too. I'll take it. Mommy. Now knowing what kind of challenges lie ahead, I make sure to EV train against Purloin. No, not because Ashley hates cats. Because I know we're going to need as many speedy Vs as we can get, but the level cap is approaching quickly. A little while later, we arrive in Striaton City, the location of the first gym. Before we take it on though, we have our first major challenge, Charon, whose Tepig now has a fire move, Ember. Uh oh. There's not much more we can do in terms of preparation though, so let's see what we can manage. He leaves with Tepig, and I go for Rollout right away. Thankfully, Tepig doesn't have the fighting type yet, so Rollout is super effective. However, we miss our second attack, ending the chain, and now we have minus two defense from Tail Whip. Not a good start. Ember then hits, but does just less than half, and even after his Orenberry activates, our next one does just enough to take him down. Oof. However, he has another Pokemon, Purloin. Of course. He hits us with a scratch with our lowered defense, but even after the drops, Ashley's good defense stat pulls us through with under half remaining as the third consecutive rollout smashes him for the win. Charon also gives us some Orin Berries for winning, which are incredibly rare in this game. With that, it's time for an even tougher challenge, the first gym. The actual trainers themselves go smoothly with mostly normal types, although there was a sand attacking Purloin which crippled our rollout strategy quite hard. Here we go, the first gym leader, and since we put Venipede in the Snivy slot, we have to face the hardest one for us, Chili. He leads with a Lillipop, and for this, I have a good plan. I use Defense Curl on the first turn, not only to raise our defense, but because if you use it on the turn before you use Rollout, it actually doubles the power of it. 
Further to that, from experience, I know that using stat increasing moves entices the AI to do the same, and it ends up working as he uses workup. But right after he potions, we miss our next rollout. Oh, I was convinced it was over here. I then repeat the process, but he's going wild with the workups, so another two take him down with us taking no damage. Well, that was unexpected. Suddenly, I'm feeling a bit better about his ace, Panseer, which comes out next. It goes for workup on the first turn, as he usually tends to do amazing, so a 240 power super effective rollout smashes it. We could have survived one incinerate even, as my calcs tell me it would have done between 81 and 97% damage, so that worked out pretty well. Oh, nothing like the youthful innocence of kids playing around- I- uh... Change your perspective and the reality changes. Change your perspective and the reality changes. Change- Oh look, a slide! Well, this is awfully fun. We- <laughs> Up ahead in Wellspring Cave, we have a few battles against Team Plasma with Charon, and man oh man did this ever get close. I forgot that the two battles happened consecutively, and straight up, we were not prepared for this, especially not with a patch rat that has bide to build up damage based on what we do to it, and it also has detect to stop our rollout streak in its tracks. But amazingly, in the double battle, they kept targeting Charon's Pokemon instead, so despite entering the battle at just 11 HP, we pulled through without ending the run. Oh man. Here we can also grab the Thief TM to get type boosting items before making our way to Nacreen City where the next gym is. In one of the houses, this girl gives us the Miracle Seed. We kinda lied and told her we get a Snivy. Shh, keep it on the down low. Which should be useful for our next encounter. But unfortunately, our next encounter is just beyond this damn lineup of Plasma Grunts. Brutal. It's the little things in life that can make you happy though. Such as this Netball, perfect for a bug run. Right in front of the gym, N pops up out of nowhere for a battle, and leading with a P-Dove wouldn't have ended us if it wasn't for Defense Curl, as it baits him into using Leer, and of course Rollout being super effective, although he did hit a special gust for a third before a second hit took him down. He then sent out a Timpole, but we got a crit to eviscerate it instantly, and then his Timber barely survived on like 1 HP, but just used Focus Energy, I guess because we 4 times resist fighting after all. The Nacreen Gym is upon us, a normal type gym, and one that I'm terrified of. The trainers go smoothly enough, and at level 19 we finally learn a better stab move, Poison Tail, but I fear it might not be enough to save us. Now the next gym leader, Lenora? Oh boy. I spent forever theorycrafting for her battle, and I knew there was only one way it would be even remotely possible. We need to outspeed her Watchog. After a bunch of calculations, I found out we need 200 speedy Vs to even tie it at exactly 42 speed, which meant at 22 XP each, I could battle 200 level 4 purloins before reaching the level cap. With ridiculous preparations under our belt, let's hope to god this works. The problem is, she leads with a Hurtier with Intimidate, which we just can't avoid, instantly lowering our attack off the bat. I then go for Rollout, which does hardly anything, then Takedown slams us below half instantly. Holy. Our Orenberry helps us though, and the Recoil helps to take her below half, but then she hits us again, and we survive on just 1 HP and can take her down on the next hit. Unbelievable. We also level up here, which is 100% necessary to get the speed tie. Don't forget, you just need to be at or below the level cap when the battle starts. In comes Watchog, and I'm desperately praying this works as the damage range is close to... And not only do we outspeed, but we nail it in one 480 power attack. Oh, the sigh of relief I breathed after this was definitely one of the biggest ever. Two badges. As a reward for winning, Ashley also evolves into a beastly Whirlipede, which will give us a lot more bulk and it's a big upgrade overall. With Ashley at level 22 already, we need a way to skirt the level cap, and with the interior of the Pinwheel Forest now open to us, I have just the trick. As we can find a new encounter, this time a Sawaddle, which I catch and nickname McCormick. McCormick ends up having a quirky neutral nature and the chlorophyll ability instead of Swarm unfortunately, but we'll take what we can get. Against Team Plasma and Pinwheel, McCormick was actually fantastic, with Razor Leaf putting in some good work with its high critical hit ratio, and, well, I guess Sawaddle also having a higher defense stat than Snorlax helps a bit too. At level 20, he also evolves into a much bulkier Swadloon, a great upgrade. A long walk across the gorgeous Sky Arrow Bridge brings us to our next destination, the massive Castelia City. But before that... Huh, the people here are kinda weird, aren't they? 
Castelia, of course, brings about a bunch of cool items we can grab, including the scope lens to increase our crit ratio, which might be pretty cool in combination with Razor Leaf. We can also finally ease our XP problem with the XP share, which I attached to our HM Mon. Now, Swadloon evolves via friendship, so I make sure to get him a massage in one of the buildings to haste in the process. You can't change the nickname of a Pokemon you got from someone, because the name contains the wishes of the person who named it. Gizunite! I think this dude is the exact reason they changed that rule in later generations. <laughs> Alright, I hereby petition for Mr. Locke to officially get some redemption in Scarlet and Violet. If you know, you know. This man was literally forgotten about by Game Freak. In the north of the city, we get our best item yet for having seen enough Pokemon, the Eviolite, which increases defensive of unevolved Pokemon. Let's go. With that, let's hit up the Castelia Gym. Now, as a fellow Bug-type gym, the matchup here is a bit awkward for us, but Swadloon with the Eviolite is an absolute beast, tearing through the trainers with super effective Bug Bites since most of them are part grass, too. The third gym leader is Berg, our Bug-type Arch Nemesis, and with him having such a powerful team, we only have one option, which is granted to us by him leading with the Venipede. I send out Ashley with the Eviolite and execute our Defense Curl plus Rollout strategy. We resist almost every move he has due to our part poison type, and despite his healing attempts and our rollout chain breaking at one point, we smash through each and every one of his Pokemon. This thing is like the perfect Berg counter. Unreal. Upon realizing Swadloon literally gets no other level up moves from level 20 on, I make the commitment to take up running. Lots and lots of running. This way I can get his friendship up and eventually it all comes together as McCormick evolves into a quick and powerful Levani. Why does he upgrade for this early on? Up ahead, I attach the scope lens on McCormick because in the gate to Route 4, Bianca challenges us to battle. I decide to lead with him too against her Herdier with Intimidate because a critical hit Razor Leaf would ignore the attack drop, but we don't get one on two attacks, but her takedown recoil takes herself out at least. In comes a massive threat, Panseer. And don't forget, Levani is four times weak to fire. I protect to scout out and make sure she's going for Incinerate, which she does, so I switch into Ashley with the Eviolite, and damn, she ate that! From here, I set up a rollout strat, but as I feared, she used Yawn. Not good. We have no choice though, so I push through and KO her before falling asleep. In comes Muna next, which has super effective Psybeam against us, and she hits one and gets the confusion on it too. Ugh. I have to switch, so I send out McCormick, and Psybeam hits to nearly half before a stab super effective bug bite nails her. This worked out reasonably well though, as now when her Duot comes in, I can just go for Razor Leaf for the instant takedown. Not bad. After destroying Charon with a rollout since he led with a P-Dove, we can finally make our way through the desert route, obtaining the Dig TM along the way, which I think will be absolutely crucial since you can't get Earthquake until post-game. Further north at the Desert Resort, we have the opportunity for a new encounter, this time a Dwemble, which I catch and nickname Pete. Pete ends up having a hardy neutral nature and the sturdy ability pretty good overall. Here we can also grab the black glasses to boost dark moves, and more importantly, the soft sand for ground moves, and also the Rock Tomb TM too. A long trip has us arrive in Nimbasa City, the location of the next gym, and this grandma in one of the apartments gives us the Soothe Bell of all things, noting how much Levani likes us. Huh. You know, that would have been real useful before it evolved. Wait a minute, Pete isn't allowed to hold a tennis racket? That's discriminatory. He has pincers, he can hold them perfectly well. Anyway, welcome to the team, buddy. <laughs> In the Eastern Gate, we can get an item just as critical as the Eviolite, the Macho Brace, to double the EVs acquired on the Pokemon that holds it. The woman who lives here seems to think that living quietly by herself is important. Wait a minute, R Red, is that you? Is this where you were all these years? Y you kind of changed your hair, huh? <laughs> Realizing the threat ahead, I went nuts with EV training Pete's attack. With the Macho Brace and the XP share on an HM Mon, we can pretty much max out our EVs already, which is incredible, but will be highly necessary too. A bit of HP training against Muna was a good idea too. One terribly awkward Ferris wheel ride later, and N decides he wants to break up, I guess, as he battles us with a pretty scary team now. He leads with a Sandile, and I lead with Pete. I go for Stealth Rock right away as he uses Assurance. He then uses Embargo, so no more Orenberry for us, before a super effective Bug Bite takes him down. In comes a massive threat though, Darumaka, which could destroy our other two Pokemon completely, but the Stealth Rock damage puts him in range of a super effective Smackdown at speed and KO. Let's go. In comes Scraggy next, and Bug Bite does less than half, then he hits us with Swagger. Uh-oh. 
Our attack is raised by that, but now we're confused, but I really have no choice. I go for the rock polish, and we get it. Nice. Brick Break then hits us the half, and we make it through confusion for the bug by KO now that our attack is increased. And just in time, our embargo ends, so our Orenberry activates as Sigalith comes in, a huge threat, but we fortunately make it through confusion again for the Smackdown KO. Man oh man, Intimidate, a Scraggy, and then a Fire type, and a Flying and Psychic type. That was a scary time, but Pete is a legend. It's time for the Nimbasa Gym, quite a cool concept with the roller coasters and whatnot. And Pete's legendary status doesn't end here as Smackdown helps against the Amolgas, although Paralysis was definitely not fun. And teaching him the Dig TM helped a lot against the grounded electric types like Blitzel, although we did have to get rid of Stealth Rock for it. Now, remember how crazy Lenora's battle was? Well, I anticipate Elisa's might be even crazier. I calculated everything down to the finest details, and I think there's one singular way we might be able to do this? Everything on our team outspeeding and going nuts with Volt Switch could destroy our entire team really quickly, so let's see what we can do here. I know one thing though, we cannot get crit. We just can't afford it. She leads with an Amolga, and I send out Pete with the Eviolite. As expected, she goes for Volt Switch right away and it does 21 HP damage. As the next Amolga comes in, I get a Rock Polish off. Now we outspeed, so I hit a Smackdown, but it barely doesn't KO as she hits another to half. I knew we wouldn't KO though, so don't worry quite yet as we do the same to the other Amolga, and it Volt Switches too, and we survive on 6 HP. Now, I thought we'd be around 8 HP here, and with our huge defense and resistance, I was really hoping she didn't see the range for the priority quick attack. But after she heals up, we then hit her again and get a crit to take her down. But it's still time to figure out if I was right, as she heals her second one, then we get the two hits in a row to take it down. Thank god. I calculated it after, and the quick attack range was indeed not there, as the max she'd do was 6.9%, while we had 8% left. In comes her final Pokemon though, Zipstrika, and I need to switch as Dig won't KO. I send out Ashley, and because Pete was in KO range, I know it's a random move she'll choose, and I was hoping for quick attack, but it's flame charge anyway. Not good. Spark then hits us to just 14 HP, but this activates our swarm ability before we hit a bug bite, and it does just over half. I have to switch now though, we just have to hope for no flame charge or else this run is over. And it's Spark, but she gets a crit. No! I'm now unsure of the range as she goes for Flame Charge, but we survive on just 3 HP and then can land a Swarm Boosted Bug Bite for the KO and the win. That was ridiculous. I can't believe we escaped Deathless. On Route 5, we have another rival battle with Charon, and he leads with a Lipard, not p of, so we can't use Rollout due to Torment. So after being fake-outed, McCormick smashes Lipard for a Bug Bite for the KO. In comes his Tranquil next, but now we have an answer in Pete, and even though he got crit, Smackdown nails him as well. Pansage was then of course an easy bug bite pickoff, and his final Pokemon is now an evolved Pignite. But we have Dig at least, which unfortunately only brings him to the red before his berry. He then flame charges and raises his speed, but he misses rollout so our next attack wins us the battle, as Pete also learns Rock Slide at level 29, which is quite a great upgrade. Bro, would you just look at this circus of clowns? After getting Elisa to lower the drawbridge for us, thankfully in these games we don't have to hear anyone on the bridge talking about it being the Charizard bridge when it bears zero resemblance to one. We then arrive in Dripvale City where- oh son of a- Now for the first time ever, we actually got rejected here. And just based on our levels too? Ah, eh, we're too good for him anyway. Going ahead to Route 6 briefly, we can actually get a new encounter here, a Carablast, which we catch and nickname Larry. Okay, come on, isn't he such a Larry? He also has a neutral nature, Bashful. We take those. Picking up the Rocky Helmet at the Cold Storage, a great item, we then join... well, whatever this is. My oh my, I didn't realize storage containers were such a popular tourist destination. After having heard about us being involved in all that, our unrequited love becomes jealous and takes us back. AKA gave us the Expert Belt item. Expert Bell, love, what's the difference really? With that in hand, it's time to hit up the Driftvale Gym. As you might imagine, McCormick went on a complete slaughter in here against the trainers with Razor Leaf. I mean, it wasn't even close. During the process, we get a wicked evolution as Ashley evolves into a beastly Scolipede, making our second fully evolved Pokemon, and I teach him the Dig TM now that he can learn it. 
It's time for the fifth gym leader, Clay, the ground type expert. His team is actually a bit tricky for us even though we have a grass type, but I think I have a plan. He leads with a croc rock, but I lead with Larry of all things. Crunch hits us to just above half, but he gets the defense drop too. He hurts himself on a rocky helmet though, and I hit a headbutt to a third. Why not go for the bug buzz KO you might ask? Well, Larry was just meant to take the intimidate as I switch into McCormick who tanks Crunch pretty well. Razor Leaf then annihilates him and in comes Excadrill next, and this is the reason for that sequence. I cannot allow him to use Hone Claws, so I just go for Razor Leaf and we get the crit. Uh, that's actually not good for my plan. Then he went for Bulldoze to drop our speed instead of Rock Slide. Knowing he'll heal, I switch in Ashley, the only thing that can tank his best attack, and we outspeed with Dig to hit him below half, then he just goes for Slash. Interesting. Rock Slide wouldn't have KO'd anyway, so it's all good as Dig takes him down. In comes his final Pokemon, Palpitoad, and we have the perfect counter in switching McCormick in, as Bulldoze hardly does anything and 4 times damage Stab Razor Leaf wins us the battle and our 5th badge. The only real danger there was the muddy water accuracy drop, but he went for Bulldoze instead. All excited from our victory, I ran ahead and forgot that Bianca battles you here. At least I healed after the gym though, sheesh. At the very least, she let with Intimidate Hurtier and we had Larry out first, who could take it, then Pete resisted takedown and KO'd it with Rock Slide. Her Duot was then a switch into McCormick for the Razor Leaf knockout, and then her Panseer was handled by a switch into Pete with the Eviolite and Rock Slide. Her final Pokemon is Musharna, and Stab's super effective Bug Bite still can't quite KO it, then she uses Psybeam, but gets a crit to take down Pete instantly. No way, are you kidding me? A Psybeam crit from that thing would have taken out anything on our team, but Pete? Right before a flying gym and right before evolving at level 34 too? That was one of the worst deaths we've ever had. Rest in peace, little buddy. Up ahead is the Charge Stone Cave, which for a little bit of redemption actually holds our next encounter, as in here we can find none other than a Joltik, which I catch and nickname Sheriff. It turns out, she has a modest nature, plus special attack and minus attack. Perfection. After picking up the Magnet to boost her electric moves, we have a battle with N, and honestly, his team is ridiculous, as Steel is a really tricky type for us. It was an incredibly long and incredibly close battle, just having to whittle our way through each Pokemon with our whole team being brought low, but McCormick saved the day at the end, being left with a quarter health. Alright, honestly, this looks like the average Twitter conversation to me. Arriving in Mr. Alton has me quite scared of the gym that lies ahead, but we can get some cool team upgrades like the x TM, probably the best one in the game for our team, as well as the Shadow Claw TM and Spell Tag item in the Celestial Tower. The Mistralton Gym is of course a flying type gym, a complete nightmare for our entire team, especially now that Pete is gone, as an evolved Crustle would have been great here. Added to that, Joltik evolves the level directly after the level cap too. Oh man. Regardless, I fully EV trained the hell out of her and attached the Eviolite and she actually performed really well against the trainers. The 6th gym leader is Skyla though, and she leads with a Swoobat as I send out Sheriff. She hits us with Acrobatics off the bat for nearly half, and then we land Electro Web, but it barely doesn't KO. However, this is my plan. It drops the opponent's speed every time it's used, so after she heals, we can hit it twice for the KO. In comes on Pheasant next, and the outspeed with Electro Web instantly pulverizes it. Unreal. Her final Pokemon is Swanna, and it just used Aqua Ring, not Air Slash, so a 4 times damage, modest stab Electro Web annihilates it for the win. How was the flying type gym easiest for a bug team after just losing the Pokemon that I was planning on using? I'll never understand. For winning, we also get an incredible reward as Sheriff evolves into a monster Galvantula. Definitely deserved. At the base of Twist Mountain stands Charon, and we have our second last battle with him here. He leads with his Unpheasant, and I lead with Sheriff, who of course destroys it with ease. Pig Knight then comes out though, so I use Volt Switch, which we got from Elisa. That way we can hurt it bad and pivot into Ashley, but he didn't go for Heat Crash, instead take down, but the recoil barely doesn't KO. An outspeed with Dig then does the job though. Afterward, his Lipart merely fake outs us before going down to our newly taught X Scissor, and then Simi Sage suffers the same fate. A solid battle. For winning, Alder gives us the Surf HM, which is actually the key to our next very interesting encounter. Flying back to Nuvema Town, we can now head west to reach the hidden routes of 17 and 18. 
Our journey through them brings us to a lone house in which this man here gives us a gift egg that he apparently got from the Relic Castle. Contained in this egg is actually a viable encounter for us, so I bike around like a crazy person. However, it's an egg that takes 10,000 steps to hatch, so it might be a little while. Wandering through Twist Mountain makes me realize just how darn cool this place is. It's kind of like an underrated cave-like area in my opinion. And at the other side, we arrive in Icarus City, a really cool place where not only the next gym is, but also yet another encounter. Ironically enough, in the puddles here. A Shelmet, which we catch and nickname Pete. That's right. Pete's name is going to live on forever. This is how salty I was about Pete's death. Pete has a rash nature, plus special attack and minus special defense, which isn't bad at all. Now before we move on, we can do something incredibly cool. Now that we have both a Carablast and a Shelmet, we can trade them both for each other using another game to evolve both simultaneously. Having Larry evolve into an Escavalier with a monstrous 135 attack stat, and Pete evolving into an Aselgor with a ridiculous 145 speed. Hey look, the citizens of Icarus are even celebrating. At level 37, Larry also learns Iron Head, giving us some much needed steel coverage. The Icarus Gym is where we're headed next, and I'm sure you can imagine how the trainers went. Larry resists ice and has Stab's super effective 135 attack Iron Head, which devastates nearly everything in here, even after charms and acid armors. There was just no hope for any of them. While in the gym, our egg actually ends up hatching too, granting us a brand new Larvesta, which I nicknamed Floyd. Floyd has a modest nature, which is actually not going to be great for us. You see, Larvesta doesn't evolve until level 59, which is well after the final battle level cap, so he'll be stuck with the Eviolite, and currently he has way better attack than special attack, and doesn't get any special moves from level up, and Flamethrower is a post-game TM. As such, I'm going to go with a weird physically offensive bulky threat, and I EV train him that way. The seventh gym leader is Bryson, the ice type trainer, and looking at his team, I'm actually going to give Floyd a chance here. You see, he has flame charge, which does good damage even after acid armor, and raises his speed too, so we can start out speeding everything quickly with a very bulky threat. Vanillish goes down in four attacks after he heals, and in comes Bear Tick. Even with him having Brine, I'm feeling okay with the Eviolite attached, as we outspeed and hit him to half with Flame Charge, but he goes for Swagger. Now, what ends up happening here is ridiculous. Floyd keeps hitting himself repeatedly, so I have to switch into Larry, another great Pokemon for this battle, but he gets confused too and hits himself repeatedly down to 13 HP. Suddenly, this has gotten scary. Thankfully, a switch into Ashley hits him to the red with x -Azur. Then Ashley finally breaks the spell and nails Bear Tick and his Cryogonal repeatedly with boosted attacks, earning us the Freeze Badge. This is the current trajectory of my life right now. In the Dragon Spiral Tower though, Floyd finally gets his chance, performing miraculously with the Flame Charge speed boost and Flame Body burning a whole bunch of physical threats too. Seriously, it was unreal how well this combo worked in tandem with the Eviolite too. He took on four trainers in a row all by himself and hardly got hurt. Alright, now in my script here I wrote crazy dragon happenings here. So uh, yeah, enjoy the crazy dragon happenings. Oh, Charon, would you just shut up with the nonsense? What a loser! Imagine being the champion of the Unova region and the leader of the biggest crime organization in the region discussing your 30-year relationship with each other, and suddenly, two kids fall from the ceiling from nowhere. <laughs> On Route 8, we can grab two great items, the Poison Barb to boost poison moves, and also the Sludge Bomb TM, the latter of which should be great for Pete. I... I'm sorry, you what? Just in front of the Two Blind Bridge, we have our final battle with Bianca, and her team is quite powered up now. Her fully evolved Stoutland comes out first, and I take Intimidate with Sheriff, and then barely don't take it down in two signal beams, so a workup boosted Retaliate hits us hard below half, but after she heals, I learn my lesson and go for Volt Switch into Larry, and she went for Crunch, which we resist, and a Rocky Helmet recoil takes her out. Beautiful. Simi Seer then comes out, goodness gracious, but a switch into Floyd is the one thing that can handle him, although her healing during the back and forth was not great at all. I know she'll go for Lick here though, so I switch in Ashley so I can outspeed with Dig, but she paralyzes us on the switch. Back into Floyd, who gets crit on the switch, then ends up bringing him to like one singular HP before I have to switch again. I have no choice, so I send in Pete, who tanks Flame Burst well in the rain at least, so I can KO with Giga Drain for slight recovery. 
This brings out Samurott, so I go for Giga Drain for the huge damage and great recovery, but Reversal hits us hard. Knowing Priority Aqua Jet could KO us in the rain, I switch in McCormick who got crit, but Razor Leaf finished her off. That damn Musharna was then a two hit with X Scissor from there for the win. Good riddance, Bianca. Crossing the bridge has us arrive at our final gym location, Opelucid City, and it never fails to surprise me just how different this city looks between the two games. The health and fitness industries hate him. Local man discovers secret to shedding half your weight by merely holding an object. The Opelousa Gym is a dragon one, and Larry is incredible here. Resisting dragon moves, and with the Iron Head and Rocky Helmet combo, the trainers could do nothing against him at all. And, well, if I'm honest, the same one for gym leader Iris, too. Knowing she'd dragon dance with her lead, Fracture, I used Iron Defense to bring our defense to sky-high levels, then Iron Headed the hell out of her first two Pokemon. Fortunately, her Dredagon doesn't have rough skin like Drayden's does, the only difference in their teams besides gender, oddly enough. Cool thing is, her best attack is Dragon Tail, which gives us Iron Head priority for the flinch chance too. She did get one off against us with Haxorus, and the Rocky Helmet combined with a Volt Switch brought her to like 1 HP, but even if she attacked us, she'd take herself down with a Rocky Helmet Switch back into Larry, so a final attack does the job and wins us our 8th badge. At the end of Route 10 comes our final battle with Charon, and I've gotta say, given how our team is looking, I'm feeling pretty good about this one. Unfezant goes down to Sheriff's Electroweb immediately, and then in comes Embor. Here we can use Volt Switch for half damage, and pivot into Floyd to tank Flamethrower, although it did nearly half. Another hits us to just 6 HP, way too close for comfort, and then I land in Acrobatics. I have to switch here, and knowing we could survive a Flamethrower, but also that he'd select a random move since anything would KO Floyd from here, I send out Ashley, and thankfully he just went for takedown so we could retaliate with the dig for the KO. Lipard and Simisage with an instant KOs with x -Scissor from there. So, um, I wish I could say something like totally inspiring, you know? Okay, uh, best foot forward. What the hell is even that? Well, we've arrived. The gate to Victory Road. Reminiscent of Red and Blue all those years ago, the gates each represent the type of badge that you acquired. Such a cool touch that I remember being so happy about when these games first came out. A long trip through Victory Road, which always amazes me how different it is from the sequel's version, has us pick up one final encounter along the way, this time a Durant, which I catch and nickname Mike. Get it? Iron Mike? Mike has a naive plus speed and minus special defense nature, which is pretty good. At last, we've arrived. Our final destination, the Unova Region Pokemon League. As sad as it might make some people, looking ahead at our battles, I've decided to replace Floyd with Mike as I think he's the better option overall. You served us well, Floyd. After over an hour of theory crafting for the battles, fulfilling the rest of our EVs, and getting any remaining items and TMs we need, it's time for the Elite Four. The first Elite Four member is Chantal, the Ghost-type specialist. Her team looks quite terrifying for us, especially given that Ghost resists Bug-type moves. With that said, I teach McCormick the Shadow Claw TM, although even after a Swords Dance, we won't be able to KO her lead with it, and it has Will-O-Wisp too, so I come up with an alternate strat. I send out Pete first, and immediately go for the Yawn, after which she burns us. Now, I know she won't use it again, so I safely switch into McCormick as Shadow Ball does nearly half. I can then load up on two Swords Dances while she's asleep, and then land a plus four Shadow Claw for the KO. In comes her Chandelure next, and I know we can easily KO it, but there is a risk, and it happens. Her Flame Body ability burns us, but I had attached a Rost Berry so we're healed and can proceed to sweep through the rest of her team with Stab Super Effective plus four Leaf Blade. McCormick, you are a savage. The next Elite Four member is Grimsley, the Dark-type trainer, and although we have a type advantage here, there are some concerning parts to his team. Before the battle, I made sure to teach Pete the Focus Blast TM that we got from Wellspring Cave. He leads with a Scrafty, and I send out Pete with the Expert Belt. This thing's typing is tough for us, and I know we have to risk the Focus Blast, and we hit it to take him down instantly. Nice. In comes his Lipard, and after a mere fake out, we can nail it with Bug Buzz for the KO. Then, in comes Bisharp. Again, the typing is terrible here, which is why I brought Focus Blast. We just have to hope it hits with 70% accuracy, but we miss, and he hits us with Aerial Ace, but we survive with just 22 HP left. I knew we could allow one miss, we just have to hit 2 out of 3, a 66% chance, which is less than what we're supposed to get, so I risk it all, 
and we land our next one for the four times damage KO. Yes. Finally, his Intimidate Crocodile comes out, but it's no problem for Pete with the Bug Buzz knockout for the win. The third Elite Four member is Caitlyn, the Psychic type expert, and also a type that's weak to ours. Similar to Chantal, her team is really damn bulky, and it took me a while to devise a plan. She leads with a Reuniclus, so I send out Sheriff, who I taught the Light Screen TM to, which helps us absorb a Psychic. From here, I can then hit a Volt Switch, which allows us to pivot and puts her in range of an Expert Bolt attack from Durant, but on the switch she gets a crit psychic, and we survive on just 6 HP. Why does this keep happening? Regardless, from there we can slam it with Exazer, and the same goes for her Gothitelle afterward too. In comes a big threat though, Sigalyph, but with Light Screen up, I can send in Sheriff to tank the Shadow Ball and slam it with Volt Switch for the KO and the free pivot. So now, I can send out exactly what I want to, Pete, to take down her Musharna with Bug Buzz, since it had Reflect, and it actually took it out in one hit, which I wasn't expecting. Solid. The fourth and final Elite Four member is Marshall, the fighting type trainer, and funnily enough, yes, we resist fighting, but fighting resists us. Problem is, all his Pokemon have hard-hitting rock moves, and I see no easy path to victory. He leaves with a throw, and I send up McCormick, who I taught Reflect, so I get it up right away. He then misses Stone Edge, and I hit a Leaf Blade for less than half before Bulldoze then lowers our speed. I have to switch now, so I send in Larry, who has good defense and isn't weak to rock, and Stone Edge doesn't do much. He then misses his next one, and I hit X Scissor just to bring him into range of an Iron Head without him healing, which works well after he hit another Stone Edge. In comes Sock next, and I go for Iron Defense immediately, knowing Reflect will go down soon as he hits a Stone Edge. Our Quick Claw then works as Iron Head hits him with a crit down to Sturdy, and then he hits us down to half. He then heals twice in a row, so another few Iron Heads take him down, with us getting hit with another Stone Edge below half. In comes the biggest threat yet though, Conk Helder. And we're at way lower health than I thought we'd be. I switch into Mike here, and he went for Hammer Arm to hit us low. I have absolutely no choice here though, as that did over half, and nothing can be sent in safely, so... I decide my best course is just to try and go for an Iron Head Flinch, and we get it! Unreal! I now see an opportunity, so I switch into Sheriff knowing he'll Hammer Arm as we tank it with half, then use a Volt Switch, and it does enough to take him down. His final Pokemon is a Mien Xiao, a Pokemon that usually outspeeds everything on Earth, but I can pivot into McCormick for free with Volt Switch and outspeed with Reflect, then Rock Slide only does a third. From there, a high crit ratio Leaf Blade does the job, as we would have been able to survive another Rock Slide anyway. Incredible. After some crazy shenanigans where the champion of the region gets defeated by N, so now we can't even face him, and then a giant castle emerges from underground somehow, we make it to the final room. I don't think Getsus is too happy. N brought his legendary Rashiram here, just has to have the fire type of all things, huh? And he challenges us to a final battle. After using the rest of our rare candies, let's see how we can fare against a terrifying team like this one. He leads with his damn Rashiram, and I've accepted my fate here as I send out Ashley with the soft sand. I hit it hard to half with a dig, and then he obliterates us with a fusion flare in one hit. Ouch. Well, there goes our starter. From there though, we send in Mike, and N says, Do you really think you can stop us with that? What, you got a problem with ants, my dude? Here comes the Expert Bell Dig KO range. Well, we got rid of that thing at least. In comes Kling Clang next, and thank god I actually thought for a second because I was like, wait a second, why would he send in Kling Clang? It doesn't have any super effective moves on- Oh, it's a Zoroark. So I take my chances to slam it with an x scissor, and it was indeed, and goes down in one hit. Phew, a good call. Caracosta's up next, so I hit it with Dig for less than half, then Stone Edge hits us hard, and gets a crit to just 23 HP. Damn it, why? Here I switch into Larry though, knowing he'll use priority Aqua Jet, and we tank it and hurt him with the Rocky Helmet, so an Iron Head then finishes him off from there. In comes a huge threat, a nightmare for our team actually, Archeops, but I've got the perfect Pokemon out as he uses Acrobatics and gets a crit, immediately destroying Larry. Why? Why is our crit luck so bad? I needed Larry too. Not good at all. Here I can switch in Sheriff at least, who outspeeds and decimates him with Volt Switch. This allows me to pivot into Mike, but I thought he'd send out Vanillux, but he ends up sending Kling Kling out. Oh no. I'm forced to switch into Sheriff, and he uses Thunderbolt thankfully, which we resist, and then I can set up Light Screen. He just goes for Metal Sound twice, so I use Electroweb to half, then do a key play. 
I use a Volt Switch to KO, that way I can pivot into Mike to prepare for his final Pokemon, Vanillox, who subsequently goes down to a super effective Iron Head. Amazing. We lost two Pokemon, but I think our team still performed really well. Might have only been one loss without that damn crit. But it's not over yet, as Getsus loses his mind and challenges us to battle immediately afterward. He leads with a Cofagrigus, and we had Mike out first after our dead Scolipede. Expert Bell Crunch hits him to just below half, then Shadow Ball hits for a third, and another Crunch KOs him. In comes a huge threat, Hydreigon with Fire Blast, but with Mike out, we can nail him with X Scissor, but it just barely doesn't KO on like 3 HP, and then he hits a Focus Blast to KO Mike. Ouch, that's not good. From here, I need something that outspeeds him, so I go into Sheriff as he heals. Signal Beam does just over half, thankfully, so we can outspeed on the next turn to take him down. In comes Bisharp next, so I Volt Switch for over half to pivot into McCormick, the only thing that can survive a Stone Edge, but he misses anyway, so X Scissor KOs him from that range. Another huge threat comes in now, Electros, which has no weaknesses due to Levitate, and also has Flamethrower. I know I have no choice, so I hit him with Leap Blade for just about half, then 4 times damage Flamethrower burns McCormick to a crisp. Here I send in Pete, who I'm hoping has enough power, and Bug Buzz indeed gets the takedown. Next up, Bufalant. And I do not want to risk the Focus Blast miss from here, so I go for Bug Buzz for over half, and then he slams us with Head Charge, and it's an immediate one-hit KO. Unreal power. Well, it's time for our final Pokemon, Sheriff, with him having two left. At least here we can pick off Bufalon with ease, but in comes the part ground type Seismitoad. Oh boy, our only move choice here is Signal Beam, so here goes nothing. He goes for Rain Dance on the first turn, but Signal Beam does less than half. I then hit him again, just desperately hoping for a Confusion or a Crit, but we get neither, and he lands a Rain Boosted Muddy Water, but we survive on just 31 HP, however, our accuracy is dropped. I was stressing like mad here, but there's nothing more I can do. We just have to hope we can land this, and we do for the win. Unbelievable, Sheriff laying down the law. We did it. I can't believe it. We beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon White with only bug types and with just one Pokemon remaining after a brutal endgame consecutive battle. That was such a fun time. The bug types we got to work with were even better than expected and we had some really unique team members too. I hope you had fun with the run and if you did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button as it really does help a lot and grows our community. A huge thanks to my YouTube members and patrons who make these videos possible. If you'd like to support and get your name up here, the links are also down below. If you enjoyed, drop a like down below to help the video out and leave a comment letting me know what kind of run we should do next and I'll see you guys for our next challenge video.